Um, so yeah, just before I get going, I'm going to start. I'm going to be talking about being a PM in an early stage startup. I'll kind of come on to why that's the case. But before I do that, I'd just like to maybe tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I'm um, I'm Jason. I'm a I'm a product owner at Zava. Uh, Zava is an online healthcare company that helps people get prescription medication um, when they're unable to get it through their normal um, GP. So that might be because it's a treatment not offered on the NHS, or perhaps their GP is closed, or uh, you can't get an appointment, uh, or you're embarrassed to go and see them face to face. So imagine embarrassing bodies. Um, I've been a PM for around seven years. I got into product when I was at PayPal. Um, and since then, I've been working at a bunch of different companies at different sizes and at different stages of development. So I've really got to see the spectrum from working in a, a kind of big um, valley company, which was around 10,000 people, um, all the way through to working in a tiny startup with less than 10 people. So um, I've kind of worked at some medium companies in between then as well. So I've got a, this kind of wide experience, and I wanted to talk about being in a very small, small startup um, because that's an area that I often don't hear people talk about. So. Um, early stage startups, right? You've probably all seen this kind of curve before, right? Um, this is what um, early, uh, early businesses kind of go through. So um, they start off by, if you imagine this is like customer numbers or some other metric like um, revenue or something, it's, life starts out very flat. And in this period, you're trying to figure out what, what you do, like is the business going to be successful? And at some point, you hopefully hit this this point here, which is like the hockey stick, the growth curve, right? Um, now, most companies you're aware of are somewhere over to the right of here. So PayPal is like miles to the right, probably plateauing in terms of growth. Um, other companies I've worked in are like kind of still on this growth trajectory, um, but I'm really going to be focusing in on this area here. Um, now, um, you might be wondering why I focus on this area. Um, the first thing is that um, many, uh, there's a lot of product kind of uh, education out there to help you understand like the, the craft of product. So there's things like um, you know, how to do prioritization, how to look at roadmaps, um, jobs to be done. There's a whole like really well written bunch of stuff um, around product. But not so many people talk about what life is like in different kinds of companies, the different cultures that are there, and how this changes the role. So um, that's what I really wanted to focus on, especially startups, because startups are kind of this interesting, interesting place. You know, we're in an incubator now, and there's like loads of startups probably just outside. Um, and so I wanted to give a little bit of insight into what life is like there. Um, and I think that's particularly relevant for, um, for PMs. There's a lot of, um, a lot of PMs are quite entrepreneurial. Um, you know, they're, they're thinking about maybe even starting their own businesses at some point. Um, and so I just wanted to get a bit more flavor of what life is like there. All right, so the first thing is like, why join an early stage startup? Um, now there's a bunch of reasons I, I, I certainly had when I went, went small, and there's other things that I hear um, uh, other P, PMs that I've, I've worked with kind of talk about. And, and the first is really around impact, right? So um, people go, and people think mixed different aspects of impact. So I think of impact in two ways, like impact to end like customers, like people's lives, and impact that you have on the business. Um, I'm kind of thinking customer impact and kind of what I call agency, which is like the, the impact you have on the business yourself, right? So you're, you're um, one big bit of a small organization. You can have a, have a much more uh, kind of leverage in terms of what happens to that organization and whether it's successful. Um, so with the first one, kind of customer impact, again, I think of this in, in two dimensions, like how deep are you uh, impacting someone's life? So are you saving people maybe like one minute every year or are you kind of saving their life? Like that's kind of the spectrum of like how much um, depth of impact you can have. Um, and the other scale is like number of people that you impact. So, you know, are you impacting one person, like hundreds, millions, billions? Those are two levels of impact. That, those, I, I don't think you're as likely to, to get in a, in a early stage startup, right? It's a very small entity, so you're not going to get the scale that, that's there. And depending on the kind of problem that you go after, you may or may not get that kind of depth of impact as well. Um, but quite often, startups are going for new problems that no one's working on, so I think there is the opportunity to do that. But just be aware that like, those ones you can, you can get in other organizations. Um, agency, though, on the other hand, you know, you really do get that. You know, you are one um, big bit of a tiny, tiny little group of people. Maybe you're a fifth, maybe you're a tenth of the company, and so everything that you do will really have a, a large impact on the outcome of that organisation. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was uh, kind of bureaucracy slash speed. So again, these two things are kind of intertwined. Um, People think that going to a startup, you were to move really quickly. You know, the, the kind of Facebook motto of move fast and break things um, will apply more if you're in a startup. 
And certainly from a bureaucracy perspective, that's true. You're going to be able to move much faster in terms of making decisions. There's only going to be a couple of other people you ever run things by. So you'll get to move really fast in, in that regard. Um, um, and there's also, uh, but when it comes to actual speed of moving your product, et cetera, along, that's going to be a lot more varied than you, than you, than you think. Um, on the plus side, there's like a lack of kind of any legacy anything, which means you can just go and do everything greenfield, which is great. You can move quickly. But there are other benefits to being in a larger company. So things like marketing, for example, if you want to spend any money on marketing, you might not be able to do that in a small company. In a large company, you might get that. Um, also things like distribution. Distribution is really important for making something successful. And if you're in a large organization, they might have distribution channels you can enter. So you might be able to, to you know, go to market much faster than in, in a startup. Um, also team members. I don't know if you guys have like the plethora of different um, skills in your, in your team, but you might be down a designer or some other key skills that really help you move forwards. And that can mean that you actually end up going a lot slower than you would necessarily think. So speed is, 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 is more nuanced, I think. Um, a couple of the others, so uh, Greenfield Project, you know, doing something new, that's like, that is obviously there. You're creating a whole new company, hopefully doing a whole new thing. That's, that's great, and that really leads on to the next one, which is, um, a sense of adventure. Like there is this kind of, like, I certainly had it when I was in a, in a small company. You've got a real good com um, camaraderie. There's only like a few of you. You spend all day, every day with the same group of people. You do that to an extent in larger companies, but you end up mixing with lots of other people as well. Um, and it's a kind of sense of you against the, the kind of world in some ways. So that is really great. Um, but the last one I think is the, is the one that I'm, I was most interested in and certainly my main motivation for going somewhere small. And that was the kind of learning opportunity you end up getting. You get to kind of do so many different things. That kind of decision making aspect means that you get to try lots of different things as well. Um, and you get to kind of do it all, <laughs> do it all yourself. Uh, and that's, I think, a really great way of, of learning things and really cutting your teeth. So uh, the bottom one, I think, is, a, is it was one of the best motivations for, for going somewhere. Um, so that's maybe why you wanted to go and join a startup. The next question to ask is like, why is the startup hiring you? Um, this might, so, might not be something that you think about that much, but your, your classic startup looks something like this, right? You've got, your, you've got your founder CEO, you've got a couple of devs, you've got maybe a business person, maybe a couple of other people that are in and, in and around, but you never see a product manager, do you? There's no, there's no PM in most, in most startups, in most startup culture. And that's because the founders are often playing the role of the PM. Okay, so they've got um, some kind of market insight or they've got some kind of customer insight. They've got some, some knowledge about something that allows them to set up the business and that puts them in a good position to talk to your developers and guide the kind of product that's being built. So in many, um, in many situations, you won't um, find a PM in, a, in an organization like this. The time that they hire a PM is when they're starting to scale up. So they're getting bigger. There's, um, you know, the, the CEO, if they've been playing that role, starts to have to do lots of other things. They need to look after marketing teams, maybe a sales team, operations, lots of other realities start to kick in, and they need to delegate the role of the PM to a, to a dedicated person. If you're going before that scale-up stage, you're probably being brought in because the, the founders have no idea about product, design, um, and technology. And so they're, they're bringing you in to, to, to work on that. Now, this is, again, interesting because that brings a whole bunch of expectations that are likely to be on you. So they're going to probably think that they're hiring this, which is probably a project manager, right? No one knows what a product manager is. I once worked with a, a, a PM who spent about the first 18 months of being in a product manager role, going to, to loads of meetups, a little bit like this, to try and figure out what it was that he was doing. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to explain it to like friends or family. It's, it's not an easy thing. Everyone thinks project manager. Yeah, they're the one that takes, you know, produces this Gantt chart, makes sure you hit everything on deadline in times. Uh, and this is what the founders are probably thinking you are. The only reason they're hiring a product manager is because they know the developers have probably said product manager or they're talking to investors or they're getting support from somewhere else and they're saying what you really need is a product, ma product manager. But they've got no real idea of what this is. They're going to expect you to come in and to kind of take control of the tech guys, maybe talk techie to the technical people. They're going to try and make sure that their ideas get carried through and turned into features and don't get lost within the tech team. Um, they're going to hope that you work through their roadmap that they've already set up and deliver this big vi vision that they've got to investors. Meanwhile, you're going to come in and you're going to be thinking this. I'm this intersection between design, business, and technology, right? I'm really customer-centric. I focus on problems, not solutions. Um, uh, I'm strategic, and I know how to get close to our customers. 
Now, this is all true, right? You do need to do this, but just bear in mind about the expectations they have, um, because whilst you work towards this, you need to, you need to make sure you um, meet the expectations that they have. Again, I kind of mention this because I've been uh, in, in, in companies where I've seen a, a junior PM kind of talk product speak towards the CEO, and you can just see them glaze over when they, when they talk about, we need to work on problems. They don't care about problems. They've got great ideas that they think they have, and they want them to happen. So just bear this in mind when you try and, um, you, you try and steer the conversation. Um, now, this happens in other organizations. Any of you in bigger organizations probably know that not all companies are as product, uh, have the kind of product culture that you, you, you read about. But the difference here is that you're the only PM, and so you get to practice the product evangelism skills. Um, so as you try and guide people in this direction, I've got, I've got two uh, words of advice. Um, the first um, is like um, build trust with them before you try and change too much. Uh, like you, um, trust is your currency when you try and make these kinds of changes. So um, build that and don't try and do big things too quickly. And the second thing is don't try and change too many things at once. Um, okay, so. That's kind of that's what life. That's what things are like when you when you when you get in. Um, the second thing I want. The other thing I want to talk about is um, being the only product person. So you need to prepare to be um, potentially all of these things. Now you would have seen in the slides that Temi put through before. And they have a training on almost all of these topics. Now as the only PM, you probably you don't want to be doing these things. But there's the reality that you might have to end up doing a lot of these things. Okay. So if you land in and there's no designer. You're going to be talking to customers, doing customer interviews, testing any of the designs that come up, making sure you understand whether, whether things are usable, because the reality is you need to understand the customer problem and you need to see if what you've built works. Um, likewise, if you've got no designer, you're going to be doing wireframes for your developers. Um, and so, you know, and, and maybe doing things like design sprints, maybe running those as well. Um, product marketer is one that I never really thought I'd ever get close to. But again, if you don't have any marketing people, you need to figure out how you um, articulate the product, how you talk about the benefits that it has. How do you take it to market? What channels are you going to use? These are all questions that you will end up wrestling with if you don't have anyone else thinking about it. Um, the product analyst, again, this is one that even if you get into later stage companies, you're still going to need to do this because most companies don't have a product analyst. Uh, but getting data on what's happening is like the most, one of the most important things you can do because like everything is, is, is one of your best ways to help you steer the direction that you're going in. Um, so that might be doing things like setting up product analytics, um, making sure you're instrumented, thinking about what events you need. You might need to learn SQL so you can avoid bothering the devs all the time to get data every time you need it. There's going to be no BI infrastructure, so you're going to have to make sure that you can self-serve yourself. QA, again, this is one that comes in far too late in many companies, but you're going to be making sure that everything works. If you've got good devs, hopefully they'll do, be doing plenty of testing and automated testing so you don't get stuck doing regression testing every time, every time you launch something. Uh, so advocate for, on those ones. Try and push that away from yourself as much as possible, but you are the last QA always. Um, and then just other stuff that you can't even imagine, like compliance, legal. I worked in a, um, in a fintech, so suddenly I was reading through money laundering um, guidance documents to figure out how we do um, KYC processes. There's like anything that comes up, you are likely to end up needing to, to, to cover. So just be aware that you're going to be going across all of these different, different things. Now, I don't advocate you trying to do any of these things because you will not be good at them. And even as you practice on them, you're not going to get good at any of them because the reality is you're not going to have enough time to focus on any of them. You're not going to become a great designer unless you're a designer who became a PM. Um, you're not going to be a great designer because you're not going to spend the time really developing the craft. Um, but there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that's that if you ever do go anywhere else or your company grows, you will have such a better appreciation for all of these things that it'll make working with other people so much, e so much easier. So in my current organization, I'm lucky enough to not have to do any of these things. I have either people in my team or other people I can reach out to, um, but you understand their perspective. You can ask better questions of them, um, challenge them when they, when they say, when they, you know, not challenge them, but probe deeper when, when certain things come back, and that'll make it much easier for you to move forwards. So it's, it's not all bad. And at the same time, it can be quite interesting learning about some of these things. Okay, so but prepare to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Um, okay, next thing I'm going to talk about is how C-stage companies are formed, because this has some interesting effects. 
OK, so this is how seed stage companies are formed. So seed stage companies are companies that have got money to go and pursue an idea. They're normally uh, people invest in them when they've got an idea. They haven't necessarily, they may have done some experimentation, maybe some, maybe they can demonstrate some things that they've done, but they haven't really built a product. The, the seed stage money that they get is for them to go and build a product to see whether the idea is really worth, worth doing. So the way this works is founders somewhere, founding team, come up with an idea. They go start speaking to Leonardo DiCaprio, who's the Wolf of Wall Street. In this case, an angel version of him, who's a bit nicer. So someone that's got lots of money, and they go and ask them and say, I've got this great idea, can you give me some money? Um, you'll see that people that are well connected with people with money find it easier to fundraise. Um, and then once they persuade someone to give them some money, they go and hire a team, they create the A team, and boom, you've got your startup. Now this um, is interesting because it, it influences the, the kind of founders you get. And I'd like to talk about the founder CEO. Um, and I'm going to talk about them because um, they're an interesting character. You're going to be working very closely with them. And at times, there can be a tension between you and the CEO. Um, both of you are thinking about like, the future direction. Uh, you're trying to think about what features should be being built. You're, you're talking to your customers. You're, you're, trying to, you're learning a lot about the market. The CEO has an opinion on all those things as well. And that can cause a tension. Um, I'd also like to talk about it because I've seen lots of PMs talk about their CEO when they've had difficulties there. Um, I've heard other, C, uh, other PMs talk about the CEO being delusional or crazy um, and promising ridiculous things to their customers that they cannot possibly achieve. These guys are laughing at the front. Maybe they're already, they've already seen some of these things happen. Um, but I'd like to try and help gain some insight into why that might be happening. And I want to help you maybe think about how you can learn to love your CEO. Because uh, if, if you think about your, like, your, your prototypical CEO, it's like Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs was known for having this reality distortion field. If that's not delusional, then you know, maybe I don't know what is. Um, but he was a, a, you know, a visionary. But he was also known for being a bit of an asshole at times. Um, so I'd like to offer some insight into that. Um, and for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a kind of thought experiment. So I'd like you to imagine two different CEOs, OK? We have CEO 1 and CEO 2. And I'd like half of you to, to split the room kind of along here. Imagine half of you are angel investors. So you've got a bunch of cash, and you're looking to invest in a hot new startup. And the rest of you guys here are budding, budding C, uh, PMs who are thinking of uh, taking the splash and joining a startup. And I'd like you to imagine which kind of CEO you would choose. So the first, the first CEO. Okay, this CEO wants to change the world for the better. They want to make a real ding in the universe, right? Um, they're a serial entrepreneur with a successful exit. Um, they've got the only team that can win in this market. They've, got, they've hired all, all the best people, and they've already sold 50,000 pounds of orders, and they haven't even built the product yet. Okay, so that's CEO one. And CEO two is more pragmatic. They see an interesting opportunity to help businesses. They've quit their old job to focus full time on this. They've, got, um, they've only got a 90% chance of succeeding. You know, they're, re they're realistic about their, their odds of succeeding, and they need to raise some money because they um, need to finish building their product so they can actually launch and start selling it to customers. So angel investors, who would you vote for? Who would you put your money in? Is it CEO1 or CEO2? Oh, we've got a couple of CEO2s, OK. And then U UPM, CEO1? Or, or neither of the company, neither, CEO2? <laughs> Ah, the PM may be more realistic. OK. Uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, so see, uh, people who voted for one, like, what is your thinking? Anyone? Experience team orders. Yeah, orders, yeah. I think orders is a great one, right? Like, anyone read Lean Startup? It's called Lean Startup, right? Um, so yeah, any of you guys? People were more going on CO2. Uh, CO2. What was your thinking there? Sounds a bit more exciting. Sounds more exciting. OK, cool. CEO2. Yeah. Quite realistic. Realistic, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I basically argue that there's a strong selection bias for CEOs that have really strong vision, right? They can imagine a future that doesn't exist and they can try and will that future into existence. They can convince investors to put money into this venture, even though they've potentially got no track record. They can convince smart people to join their, to join their mission. And they can convince customers to pay for something, even though they've got no track record. You can imagine like, how that selects the two different kinds of CEO. That's one reason why you get people with that, that, that strong, that strong vision. Um, so next time you have people, um, oh, 
jumped a bit there, didn't I? Um, oh, it's jumping all over the place. Uh, yeah, so next time you're moaning about the CEO being delusional, um, just remember that they've got very strong vision and that sometimes when they're telling everyone about the things that they're doing and the things they've done, they can forget about the details about where they actually are. Uh, and next time, yeah, they compl you complain that they are, they are um, asking you to, they promise things to customers that don't really exist. Just remember that it's close to being a lean startup. I know there's a, there's a level which is acceptable, but yeah, you know, pre-selling something before you actually develop it is a very sensible thing to do in many situations. Okay, so how do you learn to love your CEO? Just remember that they are the best salesperson. They're going to be going out, knocking on the door, trying to get your products sold. And that's going to help them bring in lots of money, both from investors and from customers. Uh, they're going to be highly motivating for you and your team. CEOs are normally high energy people, um, and so like, try and riff off that. And when you're having trouble sometimes, just try and remember things from their perspective. Just remember that they're responsible for telling investors bad news. And so things aren't going smoothly. Um, they, they want to avoid doing that if, if it's all possible. These are people that they're going to want to go back to and ask for, for more money. So, you, so try and imagine why they, they don't want to carry that back. And also, if, if things happen at board meetings, just imagine what, what's going on there and how that can influence their behavior. Um, and remember uh, that they're responsible for everyone's jobs. So if you start talking about um, different directions that could impact anyone in, in the organization, um, they're the one that's going to have to be talking to someone, not you. Um, you're definitely not the CEO they are and just try and remember how hard it is. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have ever read the book, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It just gives a really interesting insight into maybe the, the kind of stresses that they end up going through. So just try and remember their perspective uh, and it'll make it much easier to try and uh, suck up what you're dealing with. <laughs> okay, so I've spoken about CEOs, how, how companies are formed. Um, the next thing is you kind of go into the company and you start and you get going. The first thing I'd encourage you to do is kind of question everything, okay? Do not assume anything. Um, at the beginning of a startup journey, kind of everything is basically assumption. Now you've been brought in to do something specific, maybe launch a product, build something out. But just remember that the whole business is a, is a stack of assumptions. And you, need, you, you succeed by creating a successful product, and that successful product needs to exist in a successful business. So make sure you, you, you get an understanding of where they've really tested things, where, they, where things are more uncertain, because anything that comes out in those other areas of the business is going hit, to hit what you do on the product side. So try and get as close to that as possible. Um, now, again, this is a, a, a quote from Ben Horowitz, uh, which kind of... Uh, uh, articulates that um, you know you need to measure yourself in the success of your product and so the success of the product is the success of the business so do ask those questions um, and I'm going to illustrate this point by just kind of imagining uh, a couple of different scenarios um, the first one is um, you're actually in a large cor corporation so you're not in a startup um, you're brought in and you're asked to um, work on a new feature say widget X Okay, most of the business is actually quite stable. You already know the, 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 the kind of customer segments that you go to, you know how to reach them, you've already got channels established, you've got a current value proposition, uh, you know what problem you have, and you've already got a solution, and you're already making money. So you, you know what to charge for, and you know that it's profitable. And you're launching this new widget. Um, so you, you still got a bunch of questions you need to answer. Things like, do my customers have this new problem that I'm focusing on? Um, will solving this problem help the business? Um, does my solution solve this problem and can I build this solution? So these are like your classic um, viability, feasibility, desirability type questions. But most of the foundations that you're on are, are, are quite stable. Okay, you get brought into, um, you now get brought in to launch a new product in a new, um, in a new startup. Um, you know, everyone's really happy because everyone's always got the solution sorted, right? They know what the solution is and they know what customer problem they're going for. They've been thinking about what channels they have, they know how that's going to work and they really know how they're going to price it. So everything looks good. Um, but as you get in, you start asking questions like, which customers are exactly we're we focusing on? Like, your vision is like this big, so who are we going to launch with? You start focusing on some of the customer segments. That instantly starts to maybe shift your value proposition around. You're like, okay, what value proposition do we have? You start asking more questions there. And that starts to ask you make, ask more questions. So you go, well, if our value proposition isn't quite sure, like what problem are we solving? And if we're not sure about that, then what, what revenue stream are we, are we going to charge them again? And like what's our unfair advantage? Very quickly, you can end up in this situation where you're not really sure about any of these things. Um, 
And I kind of learned this the hard way, uh, working on a B2B to C product. Um, this was a product that was essentially an employee benefit uh, that we sold to companies. They gave that product to their employees. Now I was brought in to, to work on the bit for the employees. So I come in, working for months away. And in the meantime, you know, we're unable to sell this product to any businesses. Um, and so I was super focused on the consumer bit, which was my job. I hadn't really asked that many questions about the, the other half of the business, uh, which is the, where the real customers were, right? Because these end, end, end users were never actually going to um, pay for this. It was going to be the business. In hindsight, I would definitely come back and ask a lot more questions about the overall business and be like, how do we know we can do any of these things? Because actually, there was 100% there was assumption that we'd be able to sell it to businesses based on like one report that they'd read somewhere. Um, it took me a long time to, to realize that. Um, so yeah, um, like ask those assumptions, get in there and ask those questions because anything that, that screws up in the core business is going to screw up your, uh, screw up your product. Um, sorry? Uh, yeah, I should have asked. Uh, I mean, I can't remember what questions I asked when I was coming in, but like, it definitely took a long time for me to. What I eventually ended up doing was customer discovery on the business, and at the end of that, I was like, "Yeah, this is not going to work." Um, and after that, we then looked to pivot. So, so yeah, I definitely asked those questions, interview them, grill them on all of the business assumptions. Like, what have they actually done? Um, what are they, they? Have they tested anything? Like, what kind of proof have they got on those things? Um, yeah, do that with every business, to be honest. Um, even the late stage companies I got through recently, uh, during my hiring, I think I ended up getting um, confidential things that, about their you know, financials, their growth rates, like how sustainable I didn't want to be bent again. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, uh, the other thing I'd also say that as these things become uncertain, you might find yourself needing to pivot the business in some way. Um, you know, is it your customer? Is it your problem? Um, is it like any, any of these different things? Um, my one word of advice there is if you do end up pivoting, rethink everything. So you, when, you, when you change one thing, you think, right, everything else is stable. If you just change channel, that will that'll make it easy, right? All we have to do is, is move from this area to another area. Whenever you change anything, that has big repercussions into everything else you might do. The, product, the whole product experience might be different. The, the whole profitability, the, how you're going to think about that could end up changing. And it's, um, I certainly end up thinking you, when you change one thing, you don't need to change anything else. But like, I didn't really reimagine all the things you need to change if you do end up doing a pivot. So if you do end up pivoting, yeah, try and rethink everything. So you've got a question, yeah. yeah just, um, you're talking about hiring and obviously pivoting and brilliant. Uh, I'm thinking about that, uh, Microsoft and Google, they're changing their interview technique. What they're doing is they're interviewing themselves before they try interviewing interviewees to see if they're asking themselves these questions and if they can answer them themselves before they pose them to sort of sort of people. questions to people. So are they living their values? No, the interview exercise is quite interesting because they realise they had to alter their interviewing strategies because they realised they were asking questions that sometimes they couldn't even answer themselves or their answers were quite lame and this was quite senior people as well so they kind of it made them think about where their business was going as well in terms of asking mm -hmm. these questions so I just wondered if it was an interview technique that you tried to um. Uh, I, I know I've definitely been guilty of asking questions that are difficult for me to answer. <laughs> um, uh, but sometimes uh, that's the point. Um, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really ended up... Uh, I, have, I have definitely thought about uh, the questions and how I judge. So again, this is a lesson, but like the, uh, if you get interviewed by the CEO, like they are a good salesperson. They will sell you on the dream. I've seen, I've seen the CEO sell a bunch of different people in different companies where the company is not so sound underneath. Um, so don't take people's word for it. Like think about what your um, like what your signals are for for certain things, and I think write out those criteria, and then do try and grill those during during the during the question. And if you see if you see things that don't look right, then don't just try and think oh it will be okay. Like double down on your due, due, due diligence in that area, and see if it if it if it looks good. I know that my most recent my most recent. Um, Job, whole, whole job process. I did that to the most degree, and it's been one of my best moves. So, yeah. Just wondering, in your experience, when you when you had that conversation with the founder regarding pivoting, because you, you didn't think it was a sound 
business? How, how did that? Uh, that was really difficult. Uh, yeah, conversation to have. Um, it wasn't really a conversation. It was like a long series of conversations that took um, a, a huge amount of time to um, talk about and change. So um, uh, the yeah, when I ended up doing that, the um, other founder had it had been causing issues between the, the founders as well. Uh, I think most of the company had kind of come into a similar, similar, similar place. Um, and when I had that conversation, the reason I talk about a lot of those CEO things is that I didn't really appreciate where they were coming from. And you've got to get into their shoes to see their behavior. To me, it was just really clear cut that it wasn't going to work. Right? It was just like, there's no demand here. How are we going to make this happen? If you look at it from their perspective, they're thinking, well, what are we going to sell? What are we going to tell to our investors? Um, your early investors may be closer to you than you think. So I've seen people who have founded companies who have um, tapped up uh, like people that they know in their kind of network. And so you're going to people that in your network and saying, this great idea that I sold you on is not, not working. Um, so I did, really didn't appreciate those aspects. And had I known that, I would have probably broached it in a different way. But it's a very, very hard conversation. Um, I also think that what I did wrong when I did that was say, this isn't working. No one wants to know it's not working, right? They want to know what you're going to do about it. And I didn't spend enough time thinking what are the other options and building up those to help explain why we could go in another direction. Like just saying it's not working, it's like, well, so <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, I had kind of explored some of those things, but I don't think I, I could have done a much better job and done much more due diligence on those other things. That's what we ended, ended up doing when we finally moved. We ended up having like this big offsite um, and working through a bunch of different options that we could take to see how we could try and move on those. Yeah, but it's not an easy one. When you actually get going, what you're searching for is a viable business. And you're, you're running along this line somewhere. Um, and you're going to be doing lots of different things. Um, and you're going to be le learning lots of different things and trying lots of different things. But it's going to be hard going, right? Because you don't know if you are here at this nirvana where everything's going to work. You don't know if you're, oh, don't know if you're at this point here. Yes. Finally, I need to find that everything doesn't quite work out as you expect it to. You've kind of got this false dawn, um, or you're all the way back here, and you've got a long way to go. Um, so I guess I've just got one other thing to kind of suggest as you go through this, and that's not to try too hard. Um, and what I mean by that is you're going to be putting in a lot of effort, right? Um, and you're going to be putting in lots of uh, um, you're going to put in lots of effort. But first of all, you, don't, you want to avoid burning out if you end up taking on lots of things, which can feel like it's happening. Um, second thing is you need to be strategic on what you're doing, right? So there's going to be way too much stuff for you to do. This is, a, this is a product reality. There's always too much stuff for you to do. That's why we focus so much on prioritization, because the list always grows longer and longer. But here you're going to be pulled in like every direction. Uh, customer support, you're going to be asked to do stuff there. Things will break operationally, and you're the one that just gets involved and, make, and tries to sort out the mess. Um, all these things are going to be happening, uh, but you need to focus on the high leverage things and think, what do I really need to spend my time on to really move the business forwards? Try not to get bogged down in some of these other things if you can avoid it. Um, the second thing is you need to learn about what you're doing. Not, don't just try things over and over again. So you know, if, if things aren't, aren't working, you need to kind of think about why that's happening. Um, like, did you execute it poorly? Is, there, is it something fundamentally wrong with the, that approach? Is it an assumption that you need to learn about? Don't just keep banging your head against the wall trying to hope that it will, it will work out. Learn, learn, what, learn, learn what you need to do. Um, and then the last one, which is really um, just knowing when to give up. Um, so you will keep, if, you, if you're trying something and trying something and that direction is not really working out, you're getting a signal that whatever you're doing isn't right. Um, and you need to figure, know when you need to change direction. I've got um, maybe two bits, like two things that you can use to help with this. The first is trying to time box things. So like, you know, whether you're using something in OKRs or some other kind of planning thing, like set a period of time in which you're going to try and hit a certain goal. Um, if you don't hit it, then it's just a really strong signal that, what it, that you know, market feedback, that that's not the right way to go. And you need to try and change direction. Um, the second thing, as you're trying things, is think about your, like, your core assumptions. So what are your assumptions about the, like, the, the market? Are the fundamentals still good? Like, is there the market there that you thought there was there? Um, do you still think that there's an opportunity there? Um, you know, it'll shift around in different places, but is, is, does it still look good? Um, do you think you can solve it? 
And solve it isn't just technically, it's about your team. Like, do you have the right team to, to pursue this, this opportunity? Especially if you change, you know, change strategies, right? So if you go end up like we did, going from a, a B to B kind of company where you have salespeople towards going to consumers, in the B to B context, um, some of our founders were like super strong. They were really great salespeople. Um, they could they could sell many things to organizations. We pivoted and went direct to consumer. They become much less helpful in that context. So really, really evaluate like, is your team the team that you think can succeed? If those things, things still look good, then like, you know, just keep carrying on as long as your money lasts. Um, but like, yeah, try and like review some of those things. Like your fundamentals good and try and time box things. The time boxing thing is really good for helping shift the conversation. You know, when you say, look, we've, we decided to focus on this thing and we're not succeeding, like which direction do we go in? Um, so that's pretty much, uh, yep. Question. Yep. How do you carve out enough time to be strategic? <laughs> How do you carve it? I mean, there's the classic things about saying, saying things like no, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, uh, there's, I mean, there's different techniques that people have to, to focus on, on core things. Um, I've worked with people that hide if they need to focus on something like, you, can, you know, you can shout out the world is one approach. Um, you can't always do that. Um, communicate with other people about what you, what, what the priorities are. Um, there are things. So for example, when I was in my first startup, we were just doing all sorts of different things. And I was just like, there's certain things we need to focus on. Uh, things like, uh, there are objective type frameworks that you can use. And I think they're useful for, as a first layer of kind of prioritization of like, what do we think is the most important thing? That is our objective, get everyone on the same page. That's the real, that's the core thing we wanna focus on. Cause you might just be in there and everyone is doing something different and going in different directions. That's one way to clear a bunch of stuff. Um, when other things end up breaking, um, I guess one thing that I ended up doing is uh, always having like the weekly things you need to do. You know, just maintaining focus, there's like, um, there's, there's a whole time management type things you can end up work, working with. Um, but yeah, you, you're going to have to, you have to accept that lots of things are going to be crappy and that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But the, you, those things can be crap. What you need to focus on is the thing that's really going to move the needle and then those things will get better in the future. Often your customers, if you're really solving a problem for them, will tolerate shitty areas like if you've really got um, good product market fit it doesn't matter if like there's lots of rough edges um, there's certain things you need to deliver on those are the things you need to deliver on um, yeah so focus on those um, and then yeah so that's uh, really it so in summary um, what I'm saying is you just prepare to be the jack of all trades and the master of none um, Make sure you have a great relationship with your CEO. Like it, like they are, they are a great asset. Just try to avoid it um, getting frictionful. Um, make sure you're building a business and not just a product. Try not to just think about your product in isolation. The product almost is the business when it's in its early stages. So bear that in mind. Um, question everything. So especially if you end up doing a pivot, like reevaluate everything constantly, uh, update all your assumptions, try and keep track of them. Um, and yeah, last of all, don't try too hard. Don't get burnt out. Um, it's a it's a it's a great roller coaster ride. Enjoy it. Um, cool. So that's me. Uh, has anyone got any kind of questions at this point? Yep. Um, how do you deal with a CEO that likes to micromanage, but in an area where they really don't understand what they're going on about? Yeah. So um, micromanaging. Yeah. Um, it's fine. To, it's like they know the area. They course and like, oh, we need this, but then they start to micromanage in areas where they have no expertise. But yeah. they think they, they have all the answers. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that is a difficult one, right? Um, I think the first thing to think about is like, why are they micromanaging? So, in my experience, people start to micromanage when they don't trust what's going on. Um, so, you need to figure out how you can build trust, and hopefully, over after building trust for a while, they will be less likely to micromanage in that area. Um, I think the other thing you can do, especially if it's in a domain that they're not strong at, is just let them do it and, f and screw it up and then try and show another way of doing something. Do you know what I mean? Like if they're going to really get involved then you can try and let them go away. Don't, don't do a, like I told you so type situation, but like, um, yeah, try and like, you know, people never want to change unless they are motivated to change about things. And so I think often when, if you want to take something in a certain direction, you need to let things not go smoothly because it's only by that happening that people reevaluate re what they're doing and therefore get that motivation to try and do something differently. 
Cool. Yep. Sure. Okay, so what's the advice for someone who's uh, thinking of coming out of one industry going into another industry? Going into management. product management. Not just uh, in any kind of context? So for me, I, I, I've done eight years in marketing. Yep. I've had interviews before, and they said to me, oh, you're quite a product owner, but mm, no, we can't quite see it. And I'm like, I don't understand what I can tailor yep. to explain it. Because it's like, you know, it was transferable skill, it's quite hard to explain it. And yep. That first role is always difficult, right? And, and if you're, I think if you're changing um, industries and companies, that's always difficult. Um, I think narrowing the amount of change to, to one thing can help. So, for example, if you're already in an industry, stay in the industry, but try and change role within that industry, because that way you've got a lot of domain knowledge. Like that's, that is one area of being a PM, is building up domain knowledge in whatever thing you're doing. Uh, if you've already got domain knowledge, it would be much easier to move into PM role within that same domain. So don't try and change industries and like company sizes and um, like roles all at the same time. Maybe try and narrow it down just to one. Um, so if you're in a company, I don't know what kind of size company you're in, but um, trying to move in the company is the, the best way. That's how I ended up getting into product. I, I started by being in uh, one kind of role and working quite closely with, the, with, with product people. And that's how I built up some relationships that they were happy to take you on as being junior. Uh, my current company, that's how we're bringing our junior PMs end up coming in. They've got strong domain knowledge in one area uh, and we need junior PMs and so they can transfer that way. I've seen that happen quite a lot. So um, if you're, hopefully you can do it in your company. If you don't think you can do it in your current company, try and join a company with your current role where you think that opportunity could end up arising. Obviously, that can be difficult because interviewing saying, I'm coming for this job, but what I really want to do is not do this job and do something else. Um, but um, some companies in certain areas are more, more likely to, to um, have kind of PM role. So you can go somewhere where there's a lot of product management going on. Um, and then I think once you build trust with that organization, most organizations are quite um, encouraging to try and help people move around. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any advice for kind of getting the CEO to, you, you spoke about the, the kind of project management view of, of a product manager. Yep. How do you, do you have any advice for kind of getting the CEO to, to acknowledge what, what a product manager is or like how? Yeah, so like I almost like try and make them think it's a good, like the, 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 the kind of good idea. So. Um, so your question was basically like, how do you get the um, CEO to kind of see what the what product management is about, yeah. essentially? Um, so just pick elements of product that you think you can move in. Like, don't try and like show them the whole thing. So um, if they're quite um, like roadmap driven, like feature driven, um, you can go great. Like, there's there's different aspects of this, right? So they might be asking for too many things. Um, there's some like arguments you can make around why you might want to deliver things iteratively. You can get it into your customers' hands faster. Do you want it to get it sooner? You know, doing two things at once, the same amount of people, is going to be slower than doing, well, not slower, but like it's going to take time X. If you do one at a time, even if, even if they're not interlinked in any way, you should halve the time for the first one to get there. So um, position it in terms of things that they will care about. So like, uh, speed, of like speed of delivery might be one of those things. Um, in terms of if they're very fixed on a, on a feature set, like um, understand why. Like, like you, the most, one of the most powerful tools you can have is asking questions about things, because the more like more questions you ask, the more that they might start to question about why they're doing something. Um, just think about how you do this. I remember my CEO uh, got quite upset with me at one point because he felt like he was being interrogated because um, <laughs> I kept asking why questions. Um, so do it in a, in a in a kind of try and think about how you can do it in a positive way and not making it a your idea is shit. Like why do you want to do this? Like like this is a great idea. Like how. How do we like like how like how did you come up with the idea like let's let's explore it because I need to understand it so we can deliver it and try and unwind their solution into the problem and once you get there you can then start to be like okay that that's great like this is a this is a cool problem like how do we know this is a, you know you start to go how do we know this is a problem can you do some testing like gather more evidence to help you steer things yeah sure bit of a follow up question so I've got the company to buy in on the whole product so I don't by using a roadmap actually. Yep. But um, it's a startup and it's quickly growing and quickly changing. How do you recommend best to maintain that roadmap and manage expectations on the roadmap? 
So um, the question is really, how do you, in a changing company, how do you maintain and set expectations on the roadmap? Uh, like how how far how big is your roadmap, and like what kind of like what, how's your roadmap put together? Like I, I guess is something happening? Is something <laughs> happening that makes me think that you that you're worried about it, or I'm like not worried? Um, it's just it changes a lot. Yep. For starters, um, I try and keep the next quarter pretty much cemented, but then stuff after that changes and things when they have a shareholder meeting and then stuff, that changes. And so that sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's just how do I manage the expectation better of what's there and make sure sometimes yeah. it does get looked at as like a project management tool almost and I'm trying to avoid that so, so one thing that some people advocate is like sticking don't want to do it but like like kind of problem type things on, on there so yeah. don't say it's the delivery of this thing say like this is the, the, the problem so like our customers are having this problem we think there's a big opportunity in it yeah. like, like don't define the 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 solution yeah focus it more on the on the kind of problems you want to want to focus on if you i don't know how you're thinking about measuring things but you know talking about successes or things because the thing is people don't really want deliver stuff they want their outcomes right they want to make yeah. your ceo cares about making money and acquiring customers like if you can shift the conversation onto those things then you can still meet the expectations around we're trying to move these things whilst the things underneath are shifting um so that might be something else you can do but it sounds like it's actually in a better place if you're able to change it. And as, as, as long as they understand why those things are changing, then I think that might not be, you sound like you're not in a bad place. To start it's not with. bad, it's just worrying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Why do you like working in problems? Why do I like working in problems? You said you didn't, you didn't like putting problems on the roadmap. <laughs> Just because when you try and sell that to someone that doesn't know much about product, they're just like, what do you mean? Like, it's, it's so like hard for them to grasp um, that, yeah, if you kind of say, we need to focus on problems, they're just like, I, you know, seeing the glaze happen to some people. So, um, yeah, I, like, it's what you want to be doing, but like, um, reposition it in some way so that it doesn't sound, yeah. It's, it's often that they've actually said something to someone else and that's what's driving them to say you need to do this thing like I promised the investors that we were going to do this thing so like just like yeah like you know promise to do something but like it will deliver the thing you really need like just yeah like the more you can understand it from their perspective I think it's easier to understand the motivation how do you how do you deal with promises that have been made that have been made when you're not there to to <laughs> Customers. Um, to potential customers. Yeah. Um, well, maybe even if you're in the room, and you can't necessarily like just say no. Yeah. So um, it depends on your time frames, right? So um, sometimes they don't remember all the the, <laughs> the details on those things. Um, I think the other thing to think about is to not not break the promise, but like stagger the delivery of stuff, for example. So you can say, it's not that we're not going to deliver this thing, but like, what's the most important things to you? Like you can come back in the follow up conversation to talk about those things and be like, well, you said these things are most important. So we're just not going to focus on this thing that we promised you here. And as you continue that conversation, if it's just a random promise for one customer, and you're really focusing on the common problems, hopefully you'll be picking other stuff that they might care about anyway, so you can kind of move on the table. I'm not quite sure of the context, but it might be more B2B related if they're making those kinds of things, yeah. Um, so um, that can happen. If it's really important, then you, ha you might have to think about, you know, especially when you've not got many customers, is this something we're gonna have to do to, to do you think it's gonna break this relationship? Um, that might be something you, you do end up needing to do. Yeah, there's a lot of sloppy shouldering. <laughs> that, that's that's required. That's true. That's true in every every org, I think. Um, yeah, although you can be more open in some some places. Yeah. Sure. No, I think it's a huge, huge shift in business point of view. Um, 
So take away startups, think about most companies. Most of your companies are probably not that um, kind of agile in the way they think about um, delivering stuff. Um, most companies probably still, not most, but a lot of companies still think about um, project delivery. And I think it's a change in mindset to thinking about how do we deliver, we talk about value, but how do we deliver value in chunks and not have like these unrealistic expectations about, the, about how certain we are about things in the future. So, um, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to get back to your question, which was exactly was, I don't know. If, it was still like vocabulary. Of, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, so do we see, do I see kind of um, project and product management as two different things? I definitely see them as two two different things. Um, the the companies with I think with a more project management mindset almost always output out output del, um, focused, while as I think if you m can move it more to outcome focused, you get away from projects because very quickly you start in a direction and realize the project you're working on should be something different, and if you don't have the ability to, to change that, then um, you're not being as outcome focused. And actually, that's largely driven by um, like management often, who like to be able to review all of the ideas and go, yeah, this is one that we bless, and therefore this should happen. Um, this is one that shouldn't happen. What they should really be doing is betting on the things they want to happen, and then letting other people figure them out. And yeah, if you're talking projects a lot, I find that generally it's because they're output focused. <laughs> In Agile, it's product ownership. You have the role is completely project managers generally considered scrum masters or campaigners. Yeah, you do get see that at times. I think it's because they're, they're still trying to manage projects from the top, right? So they're, um, people have heard of like um, Agile Waterfall, everyone come across this concept. Right, everyone, everyone laugh, right? So, yeah, so like I think often you end up, yeah, with the, with the project managers being scrum masters. Like um, the places I've seen them be most agile don't have that kind of role, really. Um, you can be got a product, like a project manager, scrum master. Like, um, uh, like my current company has an agile coach who's the equivalent of the scrum master, who's not in a team, who's not delivering anything, he just comes to the ceremonies for the, for the team. So there's a product owner, no real scrum master, just a, just a coach, I'd say. Um, and yeah, they're not really involved in any of the, the core initiative type things we're doing. Any other questions? Yep. Have you uh, dealt with a situation without a clear engineering manager? Um, uh, e ooh. Without a clear engineering manager, what kind of doing? So the question is, um, have we have I dealt with some uh, situation without a clear in, uh, engineering manager? Yeah. Uh, and the engineering manager is, is there something you're looking for them to? Well, do? there is no clear engineering manager. Just a bunch of different developers that you're working with in team. Um, I've worked in some where maybe there's a. Li what, do you have any advice for that? Or any well, what kind of problem are you encountering? Uh, so I mean, it's it's kind of, it's, it's kind of hard to negotiate on on how things get built or how they. Like, if you think about trying to deliver things fast and get get the value out as soon as possible, yep. you'll have like, a team of so there's four developers. Yep. Each of each of them kind of. They, they do work together, yep. but again, there's no clear engineering direction. Yep. Okay. So a lot of the time, a lot of stuff won't come up until it actually really, really needs doing it, or you've just set you back. So there's no overview of what, what's going on on the engineering, because there's nobody to go or like, okay. negotiate with properly. Okay, so it's not like, like okay, so it's like the, the tech leadership aspect, yeah. really, more than anything. Okay. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things you might you could end up thinking about. Is there anyone that's more respected in that group of people? Can you essentially find the, find the person with the most influence and use them as the as the routine? That's one possible angle. Uh, the other one I can think of is they do report to someone, right? Who who do they report to? The CEO. Yes. You can talk to them about some of those things. Um, essentially, yeah. try and get them involved with that. Yeah. Are you doing retrospectives or anything like that? Yeah, yeah you are. Okay. 
And so the things are not things are coming up in there, but they're not. Because what I found is sometimes when you're just the only kind of product focused person is that there's a much uh, stronger gravity around all of the dev things and you know things that maybe bleed into design, um, other areas like that can be much harder to get people on board. You need to find your advocates for those things. So I was lucky that in my startup where we only had developers and we had none of these other roles, uh, we ended up getting one of the developers to do the marketing um, who had done some copywriting once upon a time. And we had a front end, front, engine, in front, front end devs, if you can get them, I think, uh, depending on what you're doing, but they're normally much more customer orientated. Um, not always, but like they're, they're, they often are. And they can end up being an advocate. So again, when I was in a company with no designer, they were, they were not like the UX level, but they were kind of more UI in the UI area, but definitely much more customer centric. So um, find, find someone who's who you can bend their ear and use that to try and persuade other people, maybe.